<clears throat> All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the SSB. As you know, Leo is doing a series of uh, studies on parables. Last time we met, it was the parable of the lost shepherd. Good job, guys. <laughs> this week is the, uh, the parable, this month, I should say, is the parable of the lost sheep. So really want to hear more about it. So without further ado, Leo. Have, I keep my notes. No, I'm just kidding. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon, good evening for those of us who will be connecting with us later on. Uh, perhaps good morning for those of us who are watching us online through our uh, different streams and whatnot. I would like to say that um, it's, it has been pretty exciting to... Benny, do you need this camera here too or no? Um, it has been pretty exciting to study these teachings. Um, and I say teachings because I don't want to restrict ourselves just to the parables, um, but also to the other teachings that sometimes we go back and forth to make a connection, to make a correlation to the actual parables that we have presented thus far. Um, as Kirsten was saying, uh, the last time we met, uh, we met to discuss the parable of the Good Shepherd. And we learned quite a bit about sheep, right? And who was the sheep and what were not. Um, so I was thinking, why not keep in the same realm of the sheep? <laughs> so we kept, um, we, we, that we would like to dedicate this today to the parable of the lost sheep. It's interesting because a, as we learn with these parable, with these teachings, is it, it is... Um, as if we get closer to our master, um, Jesus, the teachings, the reminders um, that we have been receiving for ages now, right? And we, and we tend to forget. Um, and it feels as it, is, as it is Christmas again, right? Every time we, we come and we uh, learn and we discuss these parables, these teachings, and we hope that we can, that I can actually um, bring the same feelings to you guys because it's uh, beyond the reminders. It really uh, it helps us liberate ourselves from the presumptuous, you know, ways that we have towards certain teachings, right? As well as the connotations that we give to certain words, to certain feelings, too, right? And it is a great reminder that we ought to be more charitable, that we ought to be more uh, humane, right? So. I'm really happy to share this with you and to give a continuation. This parable is really interesting because not only um, it is discussed in Luke, but also um, in the Gospel of Matthew. So it, it's it's always um, um, nice to kind of uh, uh, read it and study from different Gospels, right? But we're going to focus on, on Luke, Luke 15, um, from 1 to 7. And I'll give more details about this 1 through 7 here because not everybody recognizes the first two um, verses. But there is a reason why we, bought the two ver we brought the two verses into discussion today as well. So let's dive into it. Hey, as usual, what I'd like to do, uh, we'd like to read and then we'll kind of go over some of the elements, some of the individuals within the parable and outside of the parable and make a connection, a first connection with us, right? And as we go along, we will read more and try to understand more of the elements and whatnot. So the parable is the following. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law murdered. This man welcomed sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. 
Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I'll tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And there is the parable. Very short, sweet, right? And once more, I, you know, I thought it was nice to kind of keep in this line of what is, why are we using, why Jesus, why was Jesus using the, the picture or the, uh, the, 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 the lamb, right? The sheep, the animal as an example. And we don't want this to be about sheep, about lamb, about animals. But it's important for us to understand this. It's extremely important for us to understand the value of these animals, right? And I have a couple ways. I have several ways, actually, because I was thinking, how can we actually really make a connection with ourselves, right? For, for those of us who have a pet nowadays, right, it would be that pet. But it has a different connotation as well, because... Our pet brings us a lot of joy, but it does not give us food. And the sheep was a source of food, right? Source of meat, source of uh, the skin, the wool, every, all of these things. So it, the value, I cannot um, describe the, in how valued this animal was, right? And there's the, there is the, the several teachings about the what would be a... It's not a pet. I forget the name now that is uh, commonly used. Um, anyway, the, the word escapes my, my, my mind right now, but it's, 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 there is there's much, more, much more value to it. But before we go in, because we will dive a little bit more onto this idea of the value of the sheep and what we can make a correlation to, let us try to pinpoint some of the elements of the parable. What are the parties involved outside the parable? This is outside. This is not within the parable. These are the individuals um, the, that was outside of the parable. What was, what was happening at the first line? It was told to us that the tax collectors, the sinners, uh, were all gathered around Jesus, right? The Pharisees as well. And then Jesus said something, right? So Jesus, tax collectors, the sinners, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and us. Us because there were other people there as well, and we are here. <laughs> Guess what? We're as if Jesus was telling us the same parable now, right? But these individuals were there. And we will make, it will make all, a lot of sense why Jesus told this, this parable, right? Parties involved in the parable, one of us, right? Because he says, if one of us were to lose a sheep, we would go out to rescue that sheep, right? Friends and neighbors, because after the sheep is found, friends and neighbors were called to rejoice with that individual, with one of us or that individual who went after the shepherd, right? The actual shepherd. The elements involved in the parable, the sheep, heaven, uh, that's actually from the last one. Sorry, I kept the wolf, you know, fold of the sheep. Sorry about that. So it's really the sheep only. So that's a typo there. Sorry. And then the location, it's undisclosed. I mean, this is as Jesus was gathering around with different individuals, right? As he was going through his remarkable teachings, um, teaching others uh, on the elements or things that were brought to his attention. And here it happened again, right? So what are the learnings? What are the learnings for us to think about here? Anything that you guys would like to say or any highlight thus far? If not, it's okay. Learning in terms of what you have gathered thus far. Of what we have, of the parable, whatever crosses your mind. Okay, good. Yes, so uh, Kirsten is saying that the parable is um, applicable to the individuals who were there at the time, right? I should have 
offered you. <laughs> no, I was just saying that, I mean, uh, being a sheep herder um, is it was a really popular job. It was common. So you, you could try to compare it to something that's really common nowadays that's highly valued. Just think about uh, an area. Um, I, I, you know, like so many different things. And I want to say something and people get, I don't know. You can say it. There's no wrong answer or nobody's going to question you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it could be a teacher. It could be a nurse. It could be any. I mean, there's so many jobs nowadays in comparison to back then. Um, there's so much variety, but you know, there's so it's so common. Yeah, a teacher, nurse, a doctor, you know, any of those things. Thank you. Anyone else would like to say anything? Jeanette, I, I don't know how to put in the words. You know, he he went uh, he went after the ship. It was lost. You know, I don't know how to put in in, in one word. But you know, he he cares. He he worried about the one who was lost. Very well. And that's, that's a great point as well, Johnny. Uh, what came to my mind is that we are never alone. He's always watching us. Thank independently you. Independently of who we are. Whether we're alone or together. Great point. Or great point. bad or, or good or suffering so or one thing. He's right there. That, thank you. And one thing that um, you want to say something? Go ahead, Antonio. Yeah, I, I think it, uh, because the... Um, difficult for people that time understand the understanding uh, understanding Jesus it was very uh, complex back then he used these parables uh, uh, comparing to the, the daily life their la daily lives right to make it easier for them to understand true sure. Jeanette I would say that he was, you know, he 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 shared with his, you know, his neighbors the happiness of, you know, found the sheep. It's something good, you know, mm -hmm. when you share things, if you know, people around yourself. Right. So, one one great example, um, you can give it to Kirsten actually. Um, one great example that I would like to bring to acknowledge what what, what you ladies said is the fact that have we seen those um, castaway sheeps um, like on, in the ocean when somebody gets lost in the ocean whether it's a little boat or something and the coast guard send that rescue team right to to rescue that one person it doesn't matter that one person has a huge value right and they get really excited to go and to rescue and to help people right I, you know, that's the, one of the things that comes to mind when I hear this. It's like, wow. I mean, it always amazes me because I think that they do an amazing job, right, to go and rescue that individual, right? Or when, for example, unfortunately, an, an airplane goes down, um, it, it could be as catastrophic as it, it would be, but they still send you, send for several days a rescue team or rescue different rescue teams to analyze the area to kind of rescue any, any individuals there, right? Um, but there's more to it. Kirsten is raising. I just, I, something else came to my mind. I wanted to say it. So um, working in the area in healthcare that I work from, looking at a lot of uh, statistics and data, you know, looking at 99%. Oh, okay. Like looking at this parable, right. And saying, well, 99% have done well. One didn't. Okay. All right. That's fine. So I feel like a lot of our mentality is that it's like, okay, well it, it's 80%. That's good. I, I had a result come back where, we had um, a group of people that 65% responded and we're like, okay, that's a great number. But for God, that's not a great number because you want a hundred percent. So we sometimes come with this mentality of, well, oh, 65 is good. 99 is good. But no, for God, that one is still worthy. Thank you. Great example. Thank you for the interaction. That is awesome. But let's continue with this. So who is the shepherd? What about us? We do some part. We do sometimes, right? We're not there yet. <laughs> we're not at that level that Kirsten just said that we're we want a hundred percent, right? But we're getting there. We're I Leo, I, I'm not gonna say everybody. Leo is, is still in the 20 percentile, but one day I'll be at the hundred percent. But it's us also, right? Huh? Co co shepherds, yes. But it, think about it. Uh, you know, the other day, my daughter was actually talking about the two dogs that she has. And, and she's like, which one do you prefer? I'm like, they're both beautiful creatures of God, right? 
And, and I look at them, I look at their eyes, and I see creation, right? I see the creator, right? And, 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 and it's amazing, right? Because they have, looking at the two dogs, I mean, they're pretty much uh, almost the same breed, but they have their own um, uh, character, right? They, they're different. One is extremely happy and the other one is quiet. The other one is more on his own and everything. But, you know, we, I'm using this as, you know, we can even go, if we have more than one kid, guess what? There is no choosing this over that. They're different and yet we love them equally. And yet we would leave one in the house to rescue the other, right? But more to come. What about... Who does the, the sheep represent? Us. Humanity. Now, mind you, that there is one point here that I'd like to make, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it, too. There was one that was lost, but 99 was okay, and they stayed. So does that mean, just a, thought, just a, just a thought, that the shepherd did not care about the other 99? No. But did not those nine, the other ninety nine did not need the same care at that time, right? And the other ninety nine understood, or at least at least follow through. Kirsten, can I throw a, a monkey in here or monkey wrench or wrench? Monkey, of the monkey. wrench. I, I don't even know what, what, what language I speak anymore. Um, what you just said made me think of, you know, well, the 99, how would, you know, how would they feel? And oftentimes we feel like um, the brother of the prodigal son, where we're looking at our father and saying, well, what about me? I'm here. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. But here's this wayward son and you care about him. So, but God loves all of us. And in the spirits book, it tells us, you know, the, the noble spirits say the sun shines on everybody, not just on one or two. I'd just like to say that Kirsten is not cheating. She's really connected with the message because did you know, this is an interesting fact about Luke 15, the chapter, that Luke 15 actually talks about three parables, the lost sheep that we're talking about right now, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost, lost son, that is the prodigal son, right? And uh, for those of us who are watching, um, and we want to rewatch this in the future. We will put a plug in on the on the video that you can actually go back to the presentation of the lost son. And um, for those who want, of us who want to watch the uh, the Good Shepherd, you can actually click on it as well. So it's going to be on the video there. Um, but those three parables are included on. That's actually basically it. I mean, of Luke 15, um, and there is a reason for it, right? It is to really emphasize what you just said. Emphasize on, on, the, on the much needed understanding that we have, right? That God is for all of us. That God will come after us, right? And there are some elements that we're going to talk about. It. Now, let's go back real quick and talk about the sheep a little bit more, right? The name I was able to rescue over here. Um, it is domestic animals. That's the, the, um, the precise words that I would like to use, domestic animals. Domestic animals at the time was not pets, right? It's not what we see as pets nowadays. There were dogs back in the day, but they were not as um, domesticated in the sense that we understand domestication uh, today, right? Um, they were not as as friendly as it was today, because the breeding and all those things, it took a long, long, long time for us to get to where we are nowadays in the different breeds and everything, right? But the sheep, it was a domestic animal, and it was a domestic animal in the sense that they roamed freely sometimes in the house, in the house. They knew that perhaps that it will come a point that they would have to go and, and um um, have to slaughter the animal for, for food, whatever they needed to be. But milk, remember, um, wool, right? The, the skin, the meat, trade as well was extremely important for, that, for them at that time. And the sacrifices too. Reading a little bit more about it, the goats, it's interesting because goats also 
uh, let's say the cousins of the sheep, they were they had a great value. Not much in terms of cattle. Um, you know, it was not the same as it is nowadays. But they were again uh, these animals that were um, used for many, many, many purposes. So the value was immense. It, it's 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 really hard for us human beings of this time, 2023, to understand what the value of the animal it is. And as, as uh, Antonia mentioned, that is why, that is the reason why Jesus used the sheep, the animal, because it has a, such a great value to them that it was immense, right? The fold of the sheep. Why do we bring this here? Uh, we're going to make a connection later on, but the fold was actually that we can, we, we, we hear a little bit more on the on the parable of the good shepherd, that they would leave actually the sheep, the sheep's inside and the good shepherd would stay at the door and they would not come out. They would stay, he would stay on the door, the, the shepherd would stay on the little door there so no other animals would go in, right? And it's interesting that, let's say one shepherd would have 20 sheep inside of the, of the fold and another shepherd would have 15. The 20 sheep that, let's say, this um, shepherd would own, they would follow him. But the other 15 would not follow him because they would not understand the calling. The voice, the calling was different. That's how these animals were so much domesticated. They would hear one, but not the other. And that is a connection as well that we make when we study the good shepherd that we hear sometimes not so good shepherds, and we forget the true good shepherd, which is Jesus. Just a little something for us to connect with, with the message. So I want to just go back because I want to emphasize on this idea of, the, of, the, of how important this is. But if we think about it, it went down a little bit, but it's okay. If we, if we go ahead and take the the sheep out of the equation now here, and we go to quickly on this idea of the parable of the lost coin. The parable of, of lost coins changed a little bit. There's no tax collector or whatnot, but it now becomes not a shepherd, but a woman, right? A woman saying, I lost 10 coins. I'm sorry, I had 10 coins, I lost one. So I'll go ahead and clean the house, sweep the house, right? And I find the coin. When I find the coin, I'll call my friends. They come and they rejoice with me because I found that only coin that was lost out of the 10. It, it's, once more, it's interesting how it was organized this way. So now we can, our materialistic mind can understand that number one, one coin for a woman to lose. It was quite a bit, right? And after cleaning the environment, right? And sweeping, mind you, there was no vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and the grounds were what? Dirt, right? Only a very rich person, you know, would have such a, a nice floor and whatnot. So if we think about it, right? Somebody who has no means whatsoever, number one, if they're looking for that one lost coin, because it really, they really need it, they wouldn't have a really nice house, right? And to call the friends as well and to rejoice, it was quite a bit, right? It's much like if we were to lose a third of our savings right now. We don't know where it is, right? And then when we find it, we bring, we do a barbecue or something. <laughs> Let's celebrate, right? But I want to bring also the example that is given on this parable, which is the woman. Again, think about it. What kind of friends would she call? It could be no men, Right? She would have her friends coming with her and everything because it was a very, it was not at the time to call friends, you know, gentlemen to come and rejoice with me, right? So again, just for us to think about how much of this lost sheep, that one lost one, was important for that shepherd. Do we get it? All right, let's move on. In the gospel according to Spiritism, we will see couple elements that will help us with this. And going back to the, to the parable, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers 
of the law murdered. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Let's just put a stop right here to understand who was around these individuals, right? I want to bring three of them, the publicans and tax collectors for right now. Why do I pick the pub publicans here? Because in some um, versions, they don't say tax collectors. They say the publicans, right? The publicans, as the name kind of gives it away already, it wasn't that individual that was in, um, um, responsible for public matters, right? And collecting taxes was one of them, right? Mind you, these were also Jewish individuals. They were Jews that was actually collecting taxes for the Roman Empire from other Jews. So they were not liked at all. They were the individuals, they were very despised, right? In the Gospel according to Samaria, it says, in nation Rome, this was the name given to those who were lease holders of public taxes. They were in charge of collecting taxes and income of every sort, whether in Rome itself or in other parts of the empire. What about the tax collectors, since it's here? Pretty much the same thing. These were lower class tax collectors who were mainly in charge of collecting duties of this at the city gates. Their functions corresponded approximately to those of custom officials or toll collectors. Imagine us go from one state or going through a highway that we have to, you know, pay tolls. That's these, what these individuals were doing, right? They're collecting taxes and they would keep part of it and they would pay the rest, whatever they had to pay to the Roman Empire, right? So these were not well seen individuals. Let's leave it at that. But they did not like, you know, they were not liked, right? So moving on to the Pharisees, right? From the Hebrew parash, uh, meaning division separation, tradition formed an important part of the Jewish theology. It consisted in the com compilation of the successive interpretations given to the meaning of the scriptures and which became articles of dogma. The Pharisees took an, an active part in religious controversies, servile observers of outward worship practice and ceremonies, ardent zealots, for um, proselytism and enemies of anybody with new ideas. They feigned great strictness of principles. However, behind the appearances of meticulous devotion, they hid dissolute habits, much pride, and above all, an excessive passion for control. Religion for them was more of a means to rise through the ranks than an object of authentic faith. Again, individuals that for many, were seen as someone who is up there, right? Um, and, and I like to connect with the idea of the dogmas that we see, and we see this anywhere. Not only perhaps somebody who is using um, uh, religion to exalt themselves, but also perhaps a boss who is not someone who sees their employees as a human being. Or perhaps a family member who thinks that because they are of age, everybody has to bow down, bow down to them, right? So we don't want to stay, to, to keep this in the sense that this is what they're doing, but utilizing the means that they had and quite a bit of understanding that they had of the law because they discussed, they, they chewed the laws, the mosaic laws very, um, very deeply, um, but they not, did not use to help others, right? And they were very, quote unquote, clean and, and, and exalting that cleanliness where they would not get in contact with other people uh, because they would think that they would, that would not be uh, in conjunction with their religion, right? So these were the individuals that were there gathering around and saying, this man, Jesus, he eats with these people, right? Does it make sense now a little bit more why Jesus says, one sheep is lost, God will go after. He was referring the message to whom, right? Not only to, to, to the tax collector, because it's for us, because we have been in this boat and we will be there in many ways, right? But Jesus is saying, look, if we repent, we will be rescued. So let's continue with this, because... Now I want to dive into um, 
something that is really important for us here to focus on. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? When we look at this context, and, and I wanted to take a step back. The reason I kept this, this the, the verse 1 and 2, it's exactly make this connection right here. Like I said before, many of the versions that we may read in terms of when we go to the lost sheep, the parable of the lost sheep, we will not find these two um, um, these two verses, the two first verses, right? But in a way, it kind of gives us a reference. Why was Jesus saying such a thing? And about whom he was really talking about, right? And, and, and once more, I would like to add, don't say, damn the publicans, damn the tax collectors, damn the, the sinners, right? Damn the, 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 the Pharisees. We were there. And we can fall the same way still because we're not perfect. There's nothing wrong with that. Then he comes and talks about this one sheep, one sheep being lost, right? And the 99 is staying once more in the open, open country and go after the other sheep until he finds it. I want to just help you think about at least something, a realization that I had in terms of, you know, what this help is. It's undeniable what Jesus is saying, that God will come after us, right? That God will help us, right? But there is one other element that I also would like to discuss. We're going to talk about God first, and then we're going to go over the second one. There's one thing that I would like to, perhaps I have said it here before, I don't know. I got lost twice in my life, literally lost when I was a kid. And I was looking at her, I was like, you know what, maybe it is prudent to, to say something. I don't know, how old is she now? Five. I think I was probably the same age when these two, in, around approximately the same age. One was in the mall and one was in, um, in um, a grocery store. I literally got lost, right? And I was like, okay, I'm not going to see my parents. The first thing that came to mind, I'm going to see my parents anymore, right? One time I remember in the mall was that my brother and my mother, they were walking around and I just started running around just, and I, I couldn't see them anymore. And I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> And it was, it was a large mall, too, in Rio. And quickly, that feeling was like, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen now? I don't know. Right? It's like, well, are my parents? You know, where my, well, at that time, my mother and my brother, right? And the other time was with my mother and my father at a grocery store. I mean, being five, a grocery store is huge. I mean, the, the shelves are like, oh, my God, this is, you know, nowadays you can easily find yourself, right, when you're an adult. But being a kid... It was, let me tell you, challenging <laughs> to say the least, right? And I mean, we didn't have phones at the time, nothing at all. I mean, it was this, that sense of what happened, right? And if you've been through the same situation, even after as an adult, when you get lost and you don't have a way, you don't know where you are, you're going to a new place. Even when you have GPS, you're like, wow, what's going on, right? I know it's kind of hard nowadays with GPS, right? We can easily find ourselves, but you get the point. That feeling alone is the feeling of that sheep. That feeling can be the feeling of a brother and sister who is lost, who has realized what has just happened. Perhaps in the sense that, okay, I'm lost, not knowing where it, you know, it is or whatever is happening or the grandeur of the problem, Right. But that moment, that situation, that feeling, that suffering in itself is what? What we learn that when we when we are going through troubled times. Yeah, right. Yeah. But what would we learn? I mean, it's that it's that moment that we we stop and we think I've done something, something wrong. Right. I need help that you expose yourself and you say, I need help, right? That you connect with the higher minds and say, please help me, right? And the sheep, perhaps we don't know, as an animal, I mean, if you have lost a pet and they're so disoriented that it's like, you know, and when they find you, they're like, they wanna run from you because they know <laughs> they're gonna get yelled at it, right? But some of them, they just, you know, they're happy to see you again, right? 
So I wanted to share this with you because there's got to be a connection, not only with the animal, but with us as well, with ourselves and with our brothers and sisters. As I was mentioned earlier today, today as well, this is the, 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 the sheepfold, right? But in the parable, it says that the other 99 is stayed in the open country. There was no sheepfold. And the shepherd went out to go and help that one. Why the other 99 didn't do anything? Food for thought, right? Food for thought. The other 99 stayed. Imagine us commending 99 people, stay here, I'll be right back. It's almost impossible, <laughs> right? Imagine us trying to become a shepherd and saying to the animals, 99 uh, sheep, stay here, I'll be right back. And they stay there, right? Again, I'm just going to kind of bring this to, to us because, you know, it's 1% as I'm, you know, using the analogy, Kirsten's analogy here, but it's 1% and that 99% does not need any help at this moment. They're going to stay behind, but I'm going to find this one, right? They are self-sufficient together to stay. And Christ would not have said open country if that was not what he wanted to mention to us, right? But there was one that went astray. Just something that for us to kind of combine these thoughts at the end. I want to emphasize, as I said earlier, on God and the reason why it's important for us to bring this, this, this teaching. And I rescue something from the, from, the, um, from the Spirit's book on question 13. You know, with our question to, to the Spirit asking or trying to get as close as possible to understand God, the Spirit tells us what? That God is eternal, immutable, immaterial, unique, all-powerful, all and supremely just and good. If we take one of these qualities away, it's not God. If we try to add anything else, well, try it. But that will be a moment that perhaps we need to sit down and truly discuss it because I don't know if we can add anything to these qualities right now. And there are, the Spirit tells us there are, there are qualities, and there are more, but the Spirit tells us there are qualities that we don't even understand what these qualities are. It, it, with our senses on how materialistic we are, we can't understand what they are yet. So it's important for us to simulate what we have and live with it. But this last one here, the supremely just and good, tops it all, right? Because there is no goodness without justice. There is no justice without goodness. One complements the other. And that's when the shepherd goes after the one. Even though he's leaving 99 behind, that right now does not need any help. Right? Or perhaps it could be the opposite. Leave one behind, but I'm going to go after the 99 as well. We can think the, the same way. Right? Because we know that the 99 need, needs help. Right? So it's important for us to connect. You know, I, I believe that the, the parable also helps us connect with the, this passage as well. But then, one thing also that is important for us to, to realize here is that if you were to think that, that, that one sheep was not helped, it would be relinquished to what? What are one of the things that we really have been questioning? And in Spiritism, we talk quite a bit, not only in the Spirit's book, but also heaven and hell. It's the eternal punishment. That sometimes we apply to ourselves, sometimes we apply to others as well, right? That once that sheep is lost, gets it. guess what? It's lost. There's nothing you can do, right? We think about that in terms of ourselves, so much so that we do to one another, right? That, okay, you know what? It's lost. There's nothing I can do. The eternal punishment. I need to punish myself for what I have done, perhaps a couple... Um, um, Reincarnations prior. And it says in the Spirit's book, part four, chapter two, future joys and sorrows. The doctrine of the eternal punishment is in that absolute meaning makes the supreme being an impl implacable God. Would it be logical to say that a king is very good, very benevolent, and very indulgent, that he only wants the happiness of all around him, but that he is at the same time jealous, vindictive, 
inflexible, inflexibly uh, uh, severe, and that he punishes three quarters of his subjects with the maximum penalty for any offense or infraction of his laws, even when they have broken them without having been aware of them, wouldn't that be a contradiction? How could God be less than what a human would be? If we don't make this connection, at least I, I hope that I can bring this to, if we don't make this connection reading the parable, then it just becomes a story about the sheep, right? But we have to rescue these teachings because we're talking about the, a God that is just and good and a God that we cannot connect with the most perfect human being that we see here, except one, Jesus, right? I know Kirsten is dying back there to ask a question or make a comment, but go ahead, Kirsten. No, I just wanted to uh, add something you said earlier. Um, you, when you were talking about mentioning the part of the parable where um, the 99 sheep are left in the open country and the, the shepherd goes to get the one, and what a lot of people fail to um, realize or remember, myself included, is that even in those times, there was some evidence that um, sheep herding dogs were used. Um, I know nowadays uh, what's a really common uh, herding dog is um, uh, border collies. So they're, they're very obedient. They're specific. You know, they, they help with um, herding sheep. So um, I was just thinking in my mind, we always think, oh, well, the shepherd left, left the 99. But much like, you know, God who loves us and is watching out for everyone. And, and you know, we always, you know, God never leaves us alone. You know, and even when Jesus was leaving, he said, I, will, I shall not leave you. I will send the spirit of truth, I think he said. So it's it's kind of all tangled into this as well that, you know, we're really never alone. It just seemed like that. It, it is true. I, I agree with you. Because when we say alone, when we bring the idea of being alone, it's not the, 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 the alone with no help whatsoever. Number one, there is a realization of those 99 sheep that, they understand that if the shepherd is not there, right, they need to be maintain what? Good thought, good feelings, good ideals. And many of us, we have mastered that, right? Are we the whole time praying throughout our day? No. We pray in the morning, hopefully, before we leave the house, and then we go on with our lives, right? Every, and then we may stop and say a prayer or connect with something. We think about someone who is in need and we send them a prayer or not. It crosses our mind throughout the day. That's fine. Or we even think about God, whatever way that is, right? But not necessarily we are praying all the time because we already grasp that necessity to be watchful, to be prayerful, right? We are excited sometimes, perhaps just like the sheep so are excited by uh, a, a bird passing by. Right. We see this with the dog since we we're talking about the dogs earlier. Anything happens. They're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. What happened? What happened? Right. But those sheep, they're so um, aware, self-aware that they don't lose self-control. And that is us. Perhaps a brother who received the same or a sister who received the same care, same kindness, you know, was raised in the same household. They were way more more, uh, let's say, more secure within themselves than we are. They're much more settled than we are, or vice versa, right? We see this happening all the time. We see parents sometimes saying such a thing that, you know, I, I, I raise my kids the same way, but one responds completely different, right? Or adversely, right? Or uh, some parents like to say, you know, one responds a little bit more positively than the other. It's less worse, right? But that's the idea. And I'm glad that we're having these discussions because much like when we, you said earlier too, Kirsten, the, the prodigal son, when the brother comes back repentant, right? And the older brother who was home does what? He gets upset. Well, guess what? You have been here. You are self-aware to this point because when the brother came back, he was not self-aware anymore. He was jealous. Then these are the tests, right? 
these are the tests that we receive in life. So just, just something that it's nice to make this connection with these different variables so we can learn more. But the repentance is something that the second element that also needs to happen here, right? And when we, when we, when we acknowledge the grace of God, it, which is undeniable, it's happening all the time, right? It's quite easy. The one element that I, that I like to say that is really difficult is for us to get to this, this stage of repentance. And repentance here, I would like to add as well uh, forgiveness, right? Which is, can be part of repentance, right? When we forgive a situation, when we're not dealing with the, the difficulties of the past anymore, right? In the sense that we're wishing to the neighbor who trespass or uh, our, our boundaries, let's say, right? In a negative way, and we are not wishing them anything negative, right? Then, other than what we learn on chapter 10 of the Gospel According to Spiritism, to truly forgive, right? So, I brought this passage as well of the, the, um, the, the book Heaven in Hell in chapter 7, item 16. I forget how many items are um, related to the penal code of the future life, which is a beautiful part that, you know, we again is Kardec bringing this idea that has bestowed upon us and we. Um, have brought to heart in such a negative way, a detrimental way as well, not only to ourselves, well, first of all, to ourselves, but because we do it to ourselves, we do it to others as well, is that we will burn in hell forever, right? That we are uh, um, to, to be punished forever. The punishment will continue on for the rest of our lives, right? And it says, even though repentance is the first step towards regeneration, which it is, right? It is not enough by itself. Expiation and reparation are still required. Repentance, expiation, and reparation, therefore, comprise the three necessary conditions for erasing the, the remnants of a groan and its consequences. Repentance softens the rigors of expiation because it awakens hope and prepares the way for rehabilitation. Only reparation, however, can annul the effect and thereby destroy the cause. Otherwise, forgiveness would be an act of grace alone and not an annulment of the wrong. Why are we bringing this here? Let us put ourselves in Leo's shoes right now. Lost in the mall. <laughs> if there was no repentance. If I was just were to continue walk around throughout the mall, what would, would happen? The situation would get escalated, right? more resources need to be now put forth to find the little one, right? Think about it. It's not only the mother now, the brother, since I'm using that example, but perhaps the mall security, right? And then from the mall security, what happens? What if the kid goes to outside of the mall, right? Then it's the police, then it's so on and so forth, right? Because the individual just, decide, just decided to not reconnect with the parents. And it goes on and on. As that moment goes on, as the resources, the effort are put forth and nothing happens, the child is not found, guess what? Things will continue to escalate. Now, let us put in time right now. Let's say instead of 10 minutes, which was horrendous already. For a kid, 10 minutes is a long time, right? For us to sit when we were a kid, it was very hard, right? Let us think about now two, three hours, right? That moment of realization after those three hours to understand what happened, it's a lot of suffering. And I want to make a connection here that our suffering will be proportional to the time that we are stuck without repentance. The expiation, in some cases, can be as long as or not longer, and the reparation of the resources that was utilized to rescue that individual, to rescue that situation, will also have to be put in, in its place. Um, I know I went a little bit ahead of the suffering of the sheep, of the kid, right? But we're trying to look at it here and say, if we are the lost sheep, what we ought to do and fast. Repent, number one. <laughs> right, if we do something wrong, Seriously, I mean, this is, this is the, you know, one of the teachings that we can get out of this. Or if the idea is to forgive, let's forgive. 
right? That doesn't mean we're going to accept what the world is imposing us on or the other party is imposing on us, but we're going to we'll go on with our lives, right? But let's not continue to live on, right? If there is something that we need to expiate, to go through that moment that we try to analyze what happened, right? Try to look at it and say, what went wrong, right? That in itself is suffering. That in itself is a lot of burden, right? And for sure, the reparation, right? Okay, so much resources, so much time was actually put forth for me to be here today. I'm going to do my best to do whatever I'm doing well. That is when we go back and we are the lost sheep, right? And if we are the 99, the other side that does not need help, let us help. Now, let us think about the shepherd as well. And this is something that just crossed my mind. Let us think about as well the shepherd um, after this encounter with the hundredth um, sheep. Don't we, wouldn't we, wouldn't we as good parents, good brothers and sisters, keep a close eye to that lost sheep that we just found? <laughs> What's going to happen? We're going to be looking at it and say, oh, yeah, stay here. Now you're going to come next to me instead of all the way behind, you know, the herd there, right? It's the extra care that we're going to apply, right? And that happens to us, right? When we, when, when our mentors, when the, when God keeps a close watch on that individual, on us, right? So let us do our best to be someone who truly goes through these three elements over here, three phases of reparation, if we can say that, right? Repent and expiation as in a reparation, right? So just something that we would like to bring so we can um, really bring this to our hearts, whether as the lost sheep or perhaps the 99 who at that moment did not need any help. And I like to say as well that we're, we're looking at one instance, right? One situation. Who is to say that perhaps the 24th sheep yesterday was not the one who got lost? So we cannot say the 99 that stayed behind, they were perfect. But perhaps one of them got lost a couple of days ago, and the same thing happened, right? Hopefully that sheep that got lost yesterday learned its lesson. And now we will help this one here that got lost today. Continue with the Spirit's book before we go and close the, the actual parable. There are three questions that I would like to bring for us to consolidate, really bring a good foundation to what we're talking about here. Are there spirits who never repent? We ask this all the time. And, 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 and sometimes we're reluctant to, to repent as well, right? Because we, could, we, we keep thinking about the problem or, or issue or we're reluctant to, to forgive or whatnot. And the Spirit says, there are spirits who put off their repentance, but supposing that they will never improve would be to deny the law of progress and to assert that the child will never become an adult. It's very straightforward, right? Second question in this, uh, a follow-up question. Does the duration of punishments always depend on the Spirit's own will or are the, their, excuse me, or are their punishments that are imposed on it for a specific length of time. There are punishments that can be imposed on it for a specific length of time, but God, who wills only the good of, of God's creature, creature, creatures, always welcomes its repentance. The Spirit's desire to improve is never fruitless. As I was saying early, uh, uh, perhaps the, 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 that lost sheep of today, when it's found, what will happen? They will, God will keep a close watch on it, right? And that in itself, because we are being watched, we're, you know, if we do, when we did something when we were kids, our parents, you know, kept a, a close watch on us because for that, let's say maybe two or three months that we crossed the line to say, is everything okay now? Does any more reparation needs it? But for that kid, that can be considered a punishment, right? Because we don't want to uh, bring this connotation to God either that it's a punishing God, right? 
but a remedy that is applied to a kid, right? That bitter remedy for the kid is views as a punishment, right? And the parent is like, this is for your own good, you know, for you to get better, right? This is a little, bit, a little bit long, but hang in there with me because it's certainly uh, a good uh, message as well. Question 100, uh, 1009, According, accordingly, are there or the punishment imposed never eternal? Consult your own common sense and reason and ask yourself whether a eternal condemnation for a few moments of error would not be a negation of God's goodness. In fact, what is the, what is the duration of a life, even if the if it lasted a hundred years in comparison to eternity. Eternity. Do you comprehend that word? Suffering, torture, without end, and without hope for only a few wrongs. Doesn't your reason reject such an idea? That the ancients saw in the master of the universe a terrible, jealous, and vindictive God is understandable. In their ignorance, they attributed the human passions to the deity, but that is not the God of the Christians who exalts, extols, excuse me, love, charity, mercy, and the forgetfulness, forgetfulness of offenses as the highest virtue. Wouldn't God have the qualities that God demands as a duty? Isn't there a contradiction in attributing to God infinite goodness and infinite vengeance? You say that above all God is just and that humans do not understand the divine justice. Justice, however, does not exclude kindness, and God would not be kind in condemning most creatures to a horrible and everlasting punishment. Could God make justice obligatory for everyone if they were not given the means to comprehend it? Besides, isn't justice sublime when, allied with goodness, it makes the duration of punishment depend on the efforts of the guilty to improve themselves? Therein, you will find the truth of the precept to all according to their deeds. In other words, folks, the more we delay it, the more we create excuses, the longer the punishment will be. Not in the terms that God will punish us, but the time that we're going through in itself is punishment. Until we get to the point that is something really interesting as well, that guilty is the precept of the repentance. When that coin falls, right, that idea falls that it's like, wow, I feel horrible right now. Guess what? Rejoice. <laughs> because that is the moment that we have, that we, uh, that we will start to understand that something went wrong, right, between you, first of all, and your brothers and sisters. Until then, until we create excuses, until we put on the outside, right, the responsibility that we should put on ourselves, and I say responsibility not in a bad way, but in a good way, to, to live freely, right, instead of having the, the baggage that we carry with us when we feel the guilt, the, the burden, right? And that's the moment that we have to say, have I repented or what has happened, Right? Or perhaps when we deal with our limitations and we don't understand and we fight it. I like to use the analogy of the kids again. What do they try to do when they're tired? Do they fall asleep right away? No. They cry, right? They start crying. They start nagging and doing all the things that they, you know, they have to do, right? Because they're fighting that feeling that all they need to do is to give in into falling asleep, <laughs> and tomorrow will be a more energetic day, right? So that's the idea that we want to bring with this idea of, number one, God, what God truly represents to us, right, in the sense of the rescuer, that we'll go after the, 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 the one and leave the nine-nine put, not aside, not forgotten, right? But the understanding that in order for that to happen, we have to repent, there's got to be a realization to say, all right, now, please, God, come after me, right? Until then, and we see this through the explanations of Manuel Filomeno de Miranda. We see this through Andrea Luis as well. When we see in Ocelor the different rescues, right? In other, in, other, in other books as well, 
right? We see different authors talking about the rescues of, in the lower zones of spirits who have repented. And why some are rescued and some are not. There's got to be a connection. And the connection is not from the up above down because they're there to help us. But something in our hearts have to open up in order for us to be rescued. Otherwise, the shepherd will probably be looking for, but we're not going to see it. <laughs> right? The rescue will come. We're not going to see it. Right? So there's got to be an effort. And that's what I would like to say. And by the way, these are messages from St. Louis, the first, uh, the answers for question 1007 and 1008, and, and St. Augustine for question 1009. It's a beautiful part of the Spirit's book, um, the last part of it, when I talk about the uh, future joys, right? To finalize, folks, and this is a, a pretty straightforward, and I think this it's so beautiful as well, that we actually have seen through the parable of the prodigal son. And it says, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder. I'll stop right here. And this is a beautiful picture as well, uh, painting of putting the sheep on the shoulder. Look, it's, it's an animal, right? Imagine us receiving this help from our creator. Imagine us receiving this help from our master Jesus, right? Us as the lost sheep. Say, look, you did something wrong, but I'm going to carry you right now. Let me carry you right now. Let me take the walk back to the herd for you. How many times we do that? <laughs> Not to others, to ourselves when we do something wrong, right? How many times we literally look ourselves in the mirror and say, let me love you a little bit more. Let me try to understand you a little bit more. That doesn't mean we're going to go and continue on on the old ways. I'm not saying that, folks. But to look at ourselves truly with different eyes and say, man, you know what? I did something wrong. But it's okay because yesterday I did not know any better. And today I'm going to find my way to... redo what I didn't do, perhaps, right? Or what I did wrong, right? We truly carry ourselves. Because once we start doing this more often with ourselves, we'll definitely be able to do a little bit more often with others as well. Or at least accept the idea. And it goes home. Bring ourselves back home. Bring ourselves in connection back to our creator. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and say, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep, right? So it's like calling the other, um, um, the, 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 the good shepherds and saying, I found what was lost. Rejoice with me because they know the value. Many of us perhaps would say, I lost my, I found my sheep. And they're going to be like, okay, you want a cookie? <laughs> no, they don't because the value is not the same. And this is important because sometimes we want to tell the world, but not everybody will get it, of the value of what you found, right? If you're talking about of something that happens in your family for your kids, towards your kids, for example, right? To someone who is not a parent, guess what? They're going to be like, oh, I feel sorry for you. I'm sorry. They will perhaps kind of connect somehow. But if you tell a mother or if you tell another father, they will, let me pray with you. What can I do for you? You want me to sit down and have a talk with you, and they will extend a different hand because the value is different. And we can apply this not only as our kids, but we're using the kids here because they're, they have an immense value to us, right? right? Beyond monetary value, whatever that is, you know, but we see that that's why we use that, the, the example here. I'll tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. This again, folks, it's interesting because imagine ourselves getting to the other side. Uh, this, is, this is just Leo. Imagine ourselves thinking a little bit out loud here or throwing a, a monkey wrench, as Kirsten said. Imagine ourselves getting to the other side, right? And we know our struggles. 
we know what we have done to be where we are today. And we know the struggles that we have to make to get better, hopefully, right? Imagine ourselves getting to the other side and we were sitting in a, in a location like this and you see other people being helped more than we are. And they are rejoicing on the help that these other individuals are receiving, right? How would you feel? Oh, I need help as well, right? Or will, will you be jealous? Because this crosses my mind when we are helping perhaps uh, spirit in the, in the mediumistic meeting and many of them come in groups, right? And we get to speak with one spirit that perhaps is being the voice of many, right? But not everybody gets to talk. What if we get to the other side and we're going through a common problem amongst ourselves, right? And we don't get to speak. Jeanette is the one who will be speaking <laughs> in the mediumistic meaning. Will I be jealous? Right? So it's the invitation for all of us to rejoice, even though we're not the one being treated or receiving the hug from the father. If the brother was here, I'm pretty sure there would be a little bit of a feud there, right? But it's rejoicing that perhaps my father is giving attention to my sister or to my brother who needs the most. And for that alone, I am happy, right? For that alone, I also rejoice with them because perhaps that little one needs more help or the older one. Jesus did not come, as we learn in other ways, did not come for the well-being. He came for the sick. He came for those who really needed help, right? And he reincarnated amongst the Jews. And Manu is a very, reminds this in several of his books, in several of his teachings. He came for those who need the, uh, the most help, right? Another question for us to get towards the end here. What is the true meaning of the word charity as Jesus understood it? And the answer is benevolence towards everyone, indulgence towards the imperfection of others, and forgiveness for offenses. Love and charity supplement, and this is a, a addition to the answer, love and charity supplement the law of justice because loving our neighbor is to do, them, to, to, do to them all the good possible all that we would wish to be done to ourselves. Such is the meaning of Jesus' words, love one another as brothers. It's not just the giving alms. It's not just the, the step that I, you do something for me, I'll do something for you tomorrow. If that is happening, great. Amazing. That's one step in life, right? But it's beyond that. It's that taking that at that moment that we take the other and put on our backs, and we carry it, and we take it home, right? And we call everybody to rejoice, and we rejoice, right? Or perhaps if we're the one left behind, quote unquote. I don't want to take. I don't want to. Hopefully, you don't get the wrong connotation. Give the wrong connotation. The idea of leaving behind, but. That the, the, the nine nine sheep that stay right there, stay put, I'll come back, right? That when the other one is being brought on the back, on, on the helper's back, on the shepherd's back, we don't get jealous. We rejoice as well. That in itself is charity. That is in itself in itself having love for the one who was lost. Right? Kaiba Shuta to finalize, uh, I have two more messages that is towards that, you know, for those who speak Portuguese, you can actually download this book as well, um, Parábolas and Ensino de Deus, Jesus, um, Parables and, and Teachings of Christ. He says, the father does not want the death of the wicked. He does not want the condemnation of the bad, the ungrateful, the unjust, but his regeneration, his salvation, his life, his happiness. So with these words, it, it, it's a calling for us to look at the world differently. And this is something that I shared the last time I was here as well. And for us to finalize, it says, taking pity on our ignorance, divine providence decided to send someone to instruct us in the ways of elevation. And Jesus, the sublime governor of the terrestrial planet, came in person to explain to us that God does not ask us for flattery or pomp 
nor victims, nor holocausts, but a heart full of fraternity at the service of God, so that the earth opens up finally to the glory and happiness of his kingdom. And this is um, a message, if I'm not mistaken, um, it is by Emmanuel. I believe it's Emmanuel, because the book, it's message, mixed messages, by, uh, the, the message brought between Emmanuel and Andrea Luis is to the or study and live. Uh, it's actually on chapter 47. Jesus is right here. That's why we also bring um, the teaching or the reminder on how Jesus, you know, explained to us what or, or sees charity, right? Um, and, and explains to what, what love is. Um, it, it is... It is a message of giving value to the value that it, we don't, we can't give yet, right? Of of calling our attention that we're all there, we were there, and we will be there, right? We are part of both sides: the lost sheep and those who stayed put, right? And there is always that good shepherd that is guiding us. In this case, our Master Jesus. That's why we talk about it. That's why we, we, uh, we chose to actually uh, talk about these teachings. And I know I'm going to extend it a little bit more, but that's what I would like to leave you with. Um, please if, take the time to watch the other one, especially The Good Shepherd, because I think it's a good complementation as well to this one. Um, and the, the Prodigal Son, right? Because it goes hand in hand for us to be in that position of rejoicing with the goodness that is there. The goodness that perhaps went, but came back, truly came back after repentance. So with no further ado, thank you so much um, for giving us this time to bring this passage, this teaching. Um, I don't know if there are any messages, Daniel. Should, did you put up here for us? Can I make this? Okay. Okay. I'm, oh, there it is. I'll read it. Okay. So there's a comment from online from our friend Orlando. He says, it's been so major for me lately in coming to a more logical understanding of God. Not a God that would kill billions in a flood who didn't enter an ark or one who would send gay people to hell for eternal punishment for just being a human being. Or a God who would give stones instead of bread, as Jesus, as Jesus said. I personally love the gospel saying that faith and science should come together to give a more logical faith, no more blind faith per se. Wow. Interesting comment. Perhaps um, I, with all the respect, Orlando, thank you for your um, comment, but the logical understanding of a God, right? The, this realization is, in fact, a moment of suffering until we find it, right? Because the, the, the idea that we have of God is this punishing God, right? And we accept it, and we accept it at times. How? At least I'd like to, uh, I'm going to say about myself now, because sometimes we do this to ourselves. So if we're doing we can easily associate our this this feeling that we have with ourselves on how we perceive God, how we connect with God. Because if it was different, if 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 the our realization, as if Orlando is saying here, of a true loving God, we wouldn't be punishing ourselves, and then everything comes easier, right? The repentance, the expiation, the reparation. We quickly go and we we. Um, we appreciate others. We forgive others, right? We're more kind to ourselves. I'm not saying that I am perfect with this. No. My wife here is here. You can ask her. <laughs> I'm not. I'm way, you know, far from getting to that point. But it is a calling for all of us. And I'm glad that it, he brought this to us because when we're in, you know, that feeling of indignation, right, with what's going on around the world as well, on how other people also perceive God, really affects us because we're sociable beings 
And it's natural for us to feel that way. So I'm glad that he's bringing this to us because it is if Orlando is now being carried, right, by his mentor on the mentor's back saying, come with me. Let me show you a different God, right? So thank you, Daniel. Okay. Yasko says, the lost, sheep Jesus, the lost sheep Jesus is teaching that anyone lost in sin deserves to be rescued, repent, and then to choose the right path. Is there in this parable also a lesson for us to be a good shepherd and go after a temporary lost friend or also an anonymous person? Yes, that's why at the beginning we said, who is the shepherd? Us, right? It's Jesus, it's us, because we are in that situation. We gave the example of parents, right? So, yes, we are, we are, we also to be called and say, let us go rescue this person in the middle of the ocean, right? We have our limitations. I, we're going through a, a case right now where we, we got the um, unfortunate news that a very good friend is not doing so well in the hospital. And the person who was actually giving me the 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 uh, the news, the unfortunate news, I felt that the person is a little bit on the negative side, and I'm praying for that person to change the mentality, to change its reality, right? And look at the positive side as well. And I am like that too. Sometimes I can be very critical, that so critical that instead of helping, I'm actually doing more damage. So I quickly start praying that. Whew, let us think positive, right? Let us put your preoccupations or your worries aside because God is in control. If we truly believe, guess what? Things will get better. But if that person is there, right, and it's not helping, then things may get a little bit more critical. The environment changes. We feel this, right? When somebody is really calm and say, calm down, let's, let's see what's going on. But when we get the helpers that are like, what's happening? What happened? What, what's going on? We, we feel that. So sometimes, sometimes we are not the best person. But let another shepherd come and help. But for sure, Yasko, yes, we are also the shepherd. We can be the shepherd. We are being called to be the shepherd. And to go after that brother or sister that perhaps is a brother or sister of the past, that we have done something wrong towards them. Right? And it may not take one rescue. <laughs> it probably takes several, right? It will take that repetitive and repetitive uh, rescue. Because when one thing that I forgot to mention as well, and I'm extending a little bit, I mentioned actually the one instance, right? And I also mentioned that perhaps the 25th, the 24th um, sheep that stayed behind among the 29th, today was fine, but yesterday was not doing so well, right? But if we think about it, when I say instance, is that it is one falling, is one problem. But Jesus tells us what? Forgive seven times 77, right? In numerous times, right? Don't count, because <laughs> just the math alone is complicated, right? But to forgive, we have our limitation, but we're being called to be the shepherd as well. So thank you. I don't know, before we move on, uh, oh, Daniel has a question. Thank you, Leo. Um, my question is, uh, we talk a lot of the good sh about the Good Shepherd. Um, what, what is your thought about those that wanted to be a Good Shepherd, but uh, when the rescued person is considered an enemy, and they don't go and rescue because there is no affinity? So what's your thought on that? It, it just as I mentioned, right? You know, it, it sometimes can be someone of the past that is coming back as an opportunity for us, right? Um, one thing that I it, it, that became very evident to me, and thank you for the question, Daniel, with the studies of uh, Manuel Filomeno de Miranda, and it emphasizes, um, even though I had already studied in other literature and other books through Spiritism as well, through the five books, that whenever there is a rescue, whenever there is a help, it's not only for that individual that is coming to the center or that is praying, but for the other side as well. 
think about it. If we only rescue that individual that is in front of us, our friend, the problem will continue because the other side is still doing whatever it's doing. The other side who may be causing the problem now probably is the same vibratory feud of unsettledness or of unhappiness, right? So one thing that we learn is that the rescue is on both sides. So we spiritists, or I even dare to say us Christians that accept these words, is for us to accept that when I'm asking for guidance, for help, we ought to also help if there is someone involved with this that is that wants this to happen, that wants to cause harm for me and my family, that they are also rescued because we're all, we're all connected. And that is the diff most difficult part, right? Because we often think about ourselves, right? We often are the lost sheep that don't see the other 99 that may also need help with other things, right? Or the, the, the brother who stayed in the, fa in the house with the father, right? And when the lost brother comes back, he gets upset. So it's for us to pray for us, ourselves, and for those who may be causing the problem as well. And that is very, very difficult, right? When we see, I, I love the last book that we study from Manuel Filomeno de Miranda, when you see the amount of resources that are actually put forth to help these spirits, they're working against Christianity, us spiritists, to cause harm in our lives. And, and the, the rescue that is put forth is like, wow, amazing. One God responding to one God to one rescue, right? So thank you for the question. I hope that is clear, Daniel. Anyone else that we would like to ask a question, a comment, anything else that you have in mind? Any other um, learnings from this? Kirsten. So when the learnings from this, answering your, your call to respond, is that when I think about who is this parable for the lost sheep, I think about people that feel forgotten about, people who feel like even they themselves are beyond help or they are beyond being forgiven. They are just, you know, in a pit with the darkness, with all the bad choices that they've made. And there are a great number of people in this world who think that, who truly believe that. And I feel this parable is for them, is for them to, all of us really, but to remind those that are lost, you know, who feel worthless, that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how far you have strayed, what you have done, that we have this unbelievable loving God that wants us back. And that for me is a takeaway. Thank you so much. It is true. And I'll, I'll let that be our final comments on this because the, the understanding that spiritism brings to us in terms of realizing ourselves, the, 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 who we are, right? What we were, who we are, and what we will be one day as well is immense. But not everybody is there. Not everybody has this tool to realize such a thing. And, every, and many, many people, they incarnate, they discarnate in the sense that Kirsten is saying, thinking they're relegated to suffering for the rest of their lives, right? Whether they commit something bad or crazy or not, we're not here to judge. But the feeling of, of being lost completely is very common in our lives nowadays on planet Earth. So much so that we see so many people taking off their lives directly or indirectly. So I'm glad that you mentioned this, Kirsten. I thank everyone for this moment. More to come, hopefully, and uh, more teachings for us to discuss and learn with one another. So thank you.